morning and welcome. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the James Dunn Theater here at College of, of Marin. We're very excited to have you here and glad that you can participate in this event with us. Before we begin, we have a couple of housekeeping things to take care of. Uh, if you would, take this time to go ahead and please silence your cell phones. I also want you to be aware of the exits in this auditorium. We have two on either side of the stage and then also the doors that you came in from behind. Okay. Uh, during our performance, I ask that you please keep your masks on to protect your neighbors and the people that will be performing on the stage this evening. As we begin, I also need to share some words of appreciation. I want to thank, give a big thanks to all those who have participated and prepared for this event tonight. This includes, but certainly is not limited to, ASCOM, which is our College of Marin Student Association for their support, the drama department, the faculty, staff, and students who have supported our Common Read activities this year, and I would like to give a very special shout out to our amazing College of Marin librarians, Sarah Fry and David Patterson, for their leadership and dedication. Thank you. And with that, I would like to introduce our president and superintendent of College of Marin, Dr. David Wayne Kuhn. Good evening, everyone. Wow. So thank you, Beth. Beth Patel, let's give her a big round of applause. Let me also say good evening and welcome on behalf of our Board of Trustees, our faculty, staff, and students. It's so good to be back with you. Good to be here. Good to see you. Let's hear it for you. Come on. Specifically this evening, I am joined by two of our trustees at this point in time, Dr. Paul De Silva and Juan Dean Trainer. Thank you both for representing our board this evening. So it's great to be together again. And of course, we all know why we haven't been together in a while, right? So earlier today, I received a copy of President Biden's proclamation on remembering the one million Americans lost to COVID-19. Please allow me to read the first paragraph. Today, we mark a tragic milestone, one million, one million, American lives lost to COVID-19. One million empty chairs around the dinner table, each an irreplaceable loss. I know there are those among us this evening who have also experienced loss due to COVID-19 over these past two years. And as we open our program, I would like to suggest we open our hearts, and I would invite you to join me in a moment of silence in honor of those one million lives lost and the many more across the world. Thank you. Shall we get the show on the road? <laughs> okay. Tonight is the grand finale. Grand finale of our year long festival of reading called Common Read. You see the sign, the com of common is College of Moran, right? Kind of cute. I thought it was great. You guys did a good job coming up with that. <laughs> this year, we have been enjoying the work of Isabel Allende, including A Long Petal of the Sea and the Stories of Eva Luna. She will be interviewed on the stage by one of our amazing College of Moran scholar faculty members from the English and Humanities Department, Professor. Dave Payne. Yes, let's give Dan a big round of applause. Very proud of the fact that I hired Dave. Is that what happened? <laughs> well, actually, both Daves. There's a lot of Daves in the kitchen tonight, right? We've been talking about the menu tonight, the kitchen, absolutely. So uh, before the interview, we will get a sneak peek, our own world preview of a dramatization of the stories of Eva Luna, written by Isabel. This piece is performed by our own students and directed by our newest drama instructor. Actually, she's the newest professor here at the College of Marin. She started with us in January. Professor Erin McBride, Africa. The Stories of Eva Luna opens tomorrow night and runs through May 22nd. It's going to be sold out, so I encourage you to get your tickets tonight. 
So before we enjoy the appetizer of this evening's menu, let me introduce the main course. And I was kidding with Dave, we have the appetizer, the main course, which made me the breadsticks, right? So it's all good. <laughs> which meant I should keep it short, right? Okay, it is my pleasure to introduce Isabel Allende, novelist, feminist, feminist, and philanthropist. Isabel won worldwide acclaim in 1982 with The House of the Spirits. Since then, she has authored more than 25 best-selling and critically acclaimed books, including her recent memoir, The Soul, the Soul of the Woman, Soul of a Woman, excuse me, and her newest novel, Violetta. Her work has been translated in more than 42 languages. It's just truly amazing. Let me hear an applause for that. That's incredible. In addition to her work as a writer, Isabel devotes much of her time to human rights causes. Her foundation, founded in memory of her daughter Paula, has awarded grants to more than 100 nonprofits worldwide, delivering life-changing care to hundreds and thousands of women and, and girls. She has received 15 honorary doctorates, including one from Harvard University. In 2014, President Barack Obama awarded Isabel the Presidential Medal of Freedom the nation's highest civilian honor. And who knew she lives right here in Marin County? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, and those anywhere in between, please welcome our own Professor Dave King and one of the most widely read authors in the world, having sold more than 75 million books, Isabel Allende. love and sleeping in a close embrace. This was what made it so difficult for their knees that they had never exchanged a single word. The little Heidelberg is a tavern a certain distance from the capital and located on a hill surrounded by the Danube. There, besides good music and invigorating air, they offer a unique aphrodisiac too. Make Teddy with a combination of spices. Too heavy for the fiery climate of the region, but in perfect harmony with the traditions that activate the proprietor, Don Lucaire. A table arranged in a large circle that leaves an open space in the middle for dancing are covered with green and white chess blocks. And the walls display the Colosseum from country life in the Alps. Shepherdesses with golden braids, strapping youths, and immaculate bovines. The musicians are dressed in their hosen, woolly knee sacks, turbulent suspenders, and felt hats. One plays the accordion, another one the saxophone, and a third simultaneously manipulates bass drum, snares, and top hats. The orchestra begins playing shortly after sunset. They play only polkas, mazurkas, waltzes, and European folk dances. As if they were firmly established in the Caribbean, the little Heidelberg were located on the shores of the Rhine. Dona Bergel, Don Repair's wife, reigns in the kitchen. A formidable matron, as you know, because she spends her days in a stew pot with mounds of vegetables, lost in the task of preparing foreign dishes with local ingredients. It was I who invented the turtle, who took the fruits and aphrodisiacs too, giving people 
the whispering dash through the muffled curtain. The landlord's two daughters wait on the tables. A pair of sturdy women smelling of cinnamon, clove, vanilla, and lemon, along with a few local girls, all with rosy cheeks. The clientele is composed of European immigrants who reach these shores escaping poverty or some war or other. On Saturday at about nine, when all present have enjoyed the servings of the aphrodisiac stew and abandoned themselves to the pleasures of the dance, the Mexican. <laughs> Places a helmsman's hand on her waist and pilots her. smartly before her with a discreet click of his heels and a slight bow. They never spoke. They merely looked at each other and smiled, between the gallop, gift, and a leap of some old
one December Saturday, less two years ago than others, a pair of tourists came into the little Heidelberg. These were tall Scandinavians with tan skins and pale eyes. They took a table and watched the dancers with fascination. They were merry and noisy. They clinked their Others realized that the man was speaking for the first time since they had known him, and they felt silent in order to hear him better. He uttered every word with clear determination. When he had poured out the contents of his heart, the room was so silent that Doña Raquel hurried from the kitchen to see whether someone had died. Whirling, whirling with empty arms. His only companion, playing a rum on chum.
can you hear us? All right, welcome. Um, thank you to the drama department, student, faculty, and staff for putting on the performance here. That was a sneak preview of the, uh, the full, uh, the full length um, world premiere that opens tomorrow of the stories of Eva Luna right here at College of Marin. So thank you to the drama department. If you want more info, you can check out the College of Marin website or your program. And thank you to the audience for being here. I can't see you, but I think you're out there. Um, I also hear that, um, the, uh, that we're live streaming this event as well. So hello to the internet. Hello, mom. Um, <laughs> and Isabel, thank you so much for joining us oh, here at College of Thank you. Marin. It's such a pleasure and an honor to be here. This is my first event since COVID. And I feel so happy to be here. <laughs> so happy. I don't even care if I get the virus now. <laughs> And you know, I was very moved to see the play because I wrote those stories in 1988. That's, I mean, a century ago. When I came to the United States, I fell in love and in lust with a guy and ended up moving here without an invitation. And there was no room of my own to write. So I started writing short stories because it's the only thing you can write in a short time. In coffee shops, in the car, in parks, and I have totally forgotten the stories, totally. It's pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> what a surprise. <laughs> it's, it's a beautiful story, and there's, there's one particular area of it that we oh, thought. Oh, I thought, yeah. Uh, perhaps if you have it. Yeah, one, you of the, one of the things that we're celebrating today is, is um, Spanish language and literature. And Isabel, you write exclusively in Spanish, right? Yeah. And so we thought we would hear some of the original uh, Spanish from, from the text. Okay. And, and this portion takes place uh, at the end, right? The very end. The dancing at the end. Yeah. Would you mind reading So the us? idea is that uh, he's dancing with the memory of her. And uh, the, I will read only a few sentences in Spanish to get, how many people here, our law, I can't see very well, how many of you do not speak Spanish? And how many of you do not speak English? <laughs> OK. Oh. Bailando y bailando, el capitán sintió que se iba, les iba retrocediendo la edad. Y en cada paso estaban más alegres y livianos, una vuelta tras otra, los acordes de la música más vibrante, los, pie, los pies más rápidos, la cintura de ella más delgada el peso de su pequeña mano en la suya más ligero, su presencia más incorpórea. Entonces vio que la niña Eloísa iba toman, tornándose de encaje, de espuma, de niebla, hasta hacerse imperceptible y por último desaparecer del todo. Y él se encontró girando y girando con los brazos vacíos, sin más compañía que un tenue aroma de chocolate. It's a beautiful passage, and it's, as you mentioned, it's been a long time since you wrote those words. Do you remember the genesis of that story in particular? <laughs> I don't remember what I had for breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> I'm 80, you know. At this age, of everything starts falling apart. The first thing that falls down is your breasts. <laughs> and they end up like here in your knees. But then everything else follows. <laughs> you will see that. <laughs> well, not the breast. <laughs> not the breast, David, but, but other parts. <laughs> <laughs> well, Isabel, you've had your work adapted to the stage before and to opera and to, uh, to a Hollywood film. And ballet also. And ballet also. What's it like having your, your creation? Is it, is, do you give it away to somebody else? Is that, what's that like to have your work adapted by others onto a different medium? Well, I've learned that w when s once the book is finished and you let it go, you send it to the agent and the agent sells the book around, it doesn't belong to me anymore. I can't get it back and, and change it, it's done. And it belongs to the readers and every reader in every language, in every place 
will read a different book according to their own experience or their own sentiments. And uh, so I, I don't, I, I'm not attached. And when the, some other creator comes with the idea of doing something else, I feel very honored and then I, I don't care much, I let go. Because it's, you know, if someone wants to make a film, what am I going to do? I, I don't know anything about filmmaking and I won't be watching over his shoulder. I just let it go. And then I sit in with the audience and I see it for the first time. And I see Jeremy Irons and Mel Meryl Streep playing my grandparents. And it's a bit of a shock. <laughs> yeah. well, your work has appeared in over 40 languages in translation. 43? Well, it's a lot. C counting the pirated ones, you mean? <laughs> <coughs> and you were a translator once upon a time from English to Spanish. What's it <coughs> like having your work translated the other way, from the original Spanish into English? And do you ever work with the translators, or do you let it go? I always work with the translation into with the translator into English, because translators in other languages often check the English version to compare with the Spanish and to to work. So I'm very careful with the English translation. And I have had excellent translators, always. I have never had a problem. While we're on the subject of language, um, you wrote once that language is essential to a writer. A language is as personal as blood. I live in California in English, but I can only write in Spanish. In fact, all the fundamental things in my life happen in Spanish, like scolding my grandchildren, cooking, or making love. Of course, I would be ridiculous panting in English. <laughs> Do you feel like you take on a different identity when you're speaking one language versus the other? Yeah, I'm smart in Spanish, <laughs> and I'm funny. I'm funny in Spanish, really. <laughs> you know, I'm married to a guy who is from, he, from Polish origin from the Bronx. He speaks Latin because he was raised by the Jesuits, but not a word of Spanish. So it's like two ships crossing in the darkness. We don't know, also, his hearing aids got lost somewhere. <laughs> so I have no idea what he's saying, and very seldom he understands what I say. So this marriage is going to last a long time. <laughs> yeah. Well, you just got married recently, right, in the last few you, years? You did? You did, correct? Yeah, well, not so recent, right before the pandemic. And the pandemic makes it very long. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's an eternal honeymoon <laughs> in a small house with two dogs. <clears throat> well, you mentioned a little bit about um, how you came here to, to Marin County and you have a fascinating personal history of migration like, like many of our students here at College of Marin and, and many in the audience. And can you talk a little bit about your experiences uh, uh, migrating and uh, as a refugee? Well, I, have, I, I like to say that I'm a displaced person more than, than a refugee or an immigrant because I, have, I was born in Peru, raised in Chile. My mother married a diplomat. We traveled all over. I went to different schools in different places, always saying goodbye. Then I became a political refugee after the military, military coup in Chile in 1973, and then an immigra immigrant in the United States. So people ask me from where are you? And I always say Chilean, but I go back to Chile and I know that I don't belong there either. The country has changed, I have changed, the world has changed. So I don't find the country that I have in my heart. <laughs> what? It sounds like others share that experience too. Yeah. Um, but you know, what I, what I think and I always tell especially young people who have moved to this country and feel, feel that, that, that nostalgia, that, that feeling that you don't belong, that, that you don't know the clues, that it's confusing. I always say, don't let go of, the, of who you are, of all the stuff you bring with you, your language, your customs, your traditions, your, all that, and, and, and you can have the best of everything. You don't have to forget who you are in order to become someone else. That someone else can be a combination of all the good things that you bring with you.
this this is a theme that comes up in your writing time and, and time again in A Long Petal of the Sea, one of our common read books. Oh. The characters experience this feeling of of being outsiders in, in different um, in different places and uh, being feeling displaced, yet also finding themselves at the same time and, and, and adapting to the situations that they're in. But the, in the, the long petal of the sea is based on a real event. Uh, after the, before the Second World War, there was a civil war in Spain that lasted three years. A million people died. It was horrible. A, a war between brothers and sisters. And um, it, the fascists won the war, and half a million refugees left in 24 hours and crossed the border into France. Can you imagine half a million people in one day in, in the country? The, the, the French didn't know what to do with them. They put them in concentration camps that they improvised on the beaches. And the poet, Pablo Neruda, Chilean poet, convinced the government of Chile to receive some refugees. So he chartered a, ch a ship called the Winnipeg and brought to Chile 2,200 Spanish refugees. Those people were very lucky. First of all, they escaped the fascists. They escaped the Second World War that started the day they arrived in Chile. But most important, they were received with open arms. The whole country was delighted to have, well, except the Catholic Church because they were atheists, and the right, the conservatives, because they were communists. But, but they were received with joy. There, there was a, a crowd at the port with flags and food and, and the Spanish songs. They greeted them into their homes. And those, the descendants of those people who are now fi probably 15,000 people in Chile have done for the country incredible things. If you look at the names of who are the top professors, historians, astronomers, musicians, artists in Chile, they are descendants from the immigrants of the Winnipeg. So those people found a country, but that's not usual, the, the usual experience of refugees. They find hostility. Well, I was going to ask about that. My students, I think I have some students here today. We have students, there they are, they're over there. They are you grading them or something? Yes. <laughs> I knew, I knew, that's why they're here. They have to <laughs> yeah. They've got to clap the loudest and laugh the hardest I know, out of jokes. I know, yeah. Uh, they noted in class that um, there was a, some, a portion of the book where there's some anti-immigrant rhetoric for the, for the Spanish who are coming in, and, and they noticed some parallels between, as you mentioned, what the with those on the right and the Catholic Church were saying about the Im immigrants and some of the rhetoric that we've heard here in this country. And so I was wondering if you could talk about the par parallels that you might see um, of hostility toward immigrants. Well, it's not only in the United States, it's worldwide uh, that uh, there is masses of refugee, and interestingly, most are women and children. And they are n never or very seldom received, well received anywhere. And the, the rhetoric, you can find the same rhetoric in Germany as you do here, as you did a century ago in Chile. And, and it's the same thing. They are coming to change the country. They have other ideas. They are people of another color. They, um, they come to take our jobs. They bring um, foreign ideas. And depending if it's the right or the left, the, the, the rhetoric changes a bit, but it's the same idea. It's very racist because we are tribal people and that happens all over. I mean, the, what our human condition is that we get together in tribes and we feel protected and safe there. And anybody who tries to, to come in is rejected. It's like, like animals do that too. So it takes a lot of thinking and a lot of heart and a lot of education to, to welcome everybody and to include everybody. It's very difficult. Well, you, m you mentioned the, the tribalism that happens everywhere and um, we see it in your novels, especially along Petal of the Sea with political divisions um, that you know, in, those, uh, you know, in those situations in Chile and in, in Spain, 
lead to the overthrowing of democracy by fascist uh, you know, authoritarian figures and movements. And my students have also noted you know, the, the political divisions that are, seem to be increasing here in the United States today. And I'm curious to hear your thoughts on, on what's happening uh, given your observations of the world and here in the United States. I'm horrified, but I see the same thing happen in France, for example. So it's not just us, but um, de democracy is in danger in the United States and in the world. And if you look at the, at the map of the world, there are, the, it's not most people that live under the democracy. Most people live under other regimes that are authoritarian for one reason or another. So um, what we have, we are not aware of how valuable it is until we lose it. And I can say this because this happened to me. I lived in Chile, who was the longest and most solid democracy in, the, in Latin America. And in 24 hours, we had a military coup and the country changed completely. And for 17 years, we had a regime of of repression and terror for many people. Many people got out, many people disappeared, many were tortured and killed. When I say disappeared, it's hard to understand what it is. People were arrested and you could never hear from them again. And they would deny that they had been arrested. Bodies were never found. And to this day, there are families looking for their children and grandchildren that disappeared during that time. So. Uh, it's hard to understand what is at stake here until you experience the loss. It's like health. You don't know what it is to be healthy until you get sick. With a, with a novel like A Long Petal of the Sea, how can reading these stories of um, you know, historical times and other places, uh, are they a warning to us? Are no. they, is there a lesson to learn? No, I, I do, I'm not preaching. I'm not giving a message. When I write fiction, I just want to tell a story because I like the story. And, and I like storytelling. Now, if I write nonfiction like The Soul of a Woman, well, then I can preach. It doesn't matter because there's something specific that I want to say. But I... Uh, I imagine that there must be an inner reason that I don't, I'm not aware of. Why I choose that story. Why I want those characters to say that and nothing else. To experience that and nothing else. It's because in a way, I'm trying to explore something within myself. So it's either a memory or, or something from my past or something that is an obsession or something that worries me terribly. And then it becomes, I, I transform it, I put it into a story. Everything can be a story for me. My, my brain is, is so weird that I can't think in, in, in a rational way. I can't play any game, any game. I cannot even, even nothing, because I cannot think straight. I think in circles, in spirals, and, and, and that's how I get the stories. And they, uh, that's the only thing I remember. I don't remember um, people, faces, my grandchildren. I don't remember anything. <laughs> but I remember a good story. I never forget it. <laughs> when you're telling stories in historical fiction, I had a student ask today, um, uh, I asked my students, what should I ask Isabel when we're on stage? And one student said, ask her her favorite color. And I said, no, nah, we'll, we'll oh, save that what one. what a shitty question. But, <laughs> <laughs> but a t another student asked sorry if the student is here <laughs> he knows who he is um, <laughs> oh it's a he <laughs> yeah <laughs> another student it's asked it's red by the way <laughs> another student asked when you're writing historical fiction how do you know what from the history to put in and what from the fiction to put in? How do you balance those things? Or, or what do you do in the process of, of writing historical fiction? Like First, research. Uh, if there is a time, a place, and an event 
that I research completely as much as I can from different angles, not the history books, but other voices also, then I have the stage where I will move my characters. And the, the characters in their lives or in, their, in, in, in whatever happens to them will be telling the historical events. But it's easy to write historical fiction because half the book is given by the research. So I love that. But you have to find a moment or, or an event that, that I'm passionate about. Uh, for example, I wrote a book called Island Beneath the Sea, which is the story of the only slave revolt in history that has succeeded. And that was in Haiti in 1800. And uh, why would I write about African slaves in Haiti? I don't have any connection to that. In Chile, there were no plantations, no African slaves. We enslaved the Indians, but we didn't bring Africans. And so why would I be so interested in this? The book took me four years. The hardest research that you can imagine, because slavery is a horrible thing. You can't imagine what, what people with power and impunity can do to other people. I mean, the cruelty is appalling. So I got really sick researching that book, but I, by, but I finished it eventually. And then when I finished the book, I realized why I had written it. The, the theme of the book, of course, is slavery, but deeper th than slavery is what I just said, power with impunity. And that happens not only the master and the slave, it happens the policeman that stops a black person in the street. It's, it's the power with impunity of the, of the man that, that beats up a woman and nobody knows, or beats up a child. It's the power of impunity of those people who are cruel with animals. It's the, the, the military when they are in, in invading a country, what's happening today in Ukraine. So nobody is accountable for what's happening today in Ukraine. So that's the kind of power that, that obsesses me. Because there are other forms of, of you, you can commit crimes, you can be violent, you can, but if there is accountability, there is some kind of fairness in the game, you know? But if not, then what can you do? And I lived it in Chile during the years after the, the dictatorship, that's power with impunity. And I'm telling you, it's terrible. Within those stories of, of power uh, with impunity, we also see really strong characters come through in your writing, and especially strong female characters. Um, and and um, in your nonfiction writing, we also see your, your critiques of patriarchy, uh, in particular, that, that power with, with impunity. And so I'm, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about um, yourself as a feminist and your formative experiences as a feminist. Well, I became a feminist at five. Uh, really, there was no word, but I know that I was a feminist. I was living in my grandfather's house with my bachelor uncles and my brothers, and the women in the family, my mother and the maids in the house, who did all the work, uh, had no power, no voice, no money, no freedom, nothing. While the males had everything that the others, the women did not. So I didn't want to be like my mother, although I loved her. I wanted to be like my grandfather. And then around puberty, when I, I realized that I had two prunes coming out here, <laughs> I thought, well, what is this thing? And, and I realized I could not be a man, but I, but I thought I can, at least I can live like one. And then the, the, my, my life has been about, first of all, being independent because there is no feminism if you are not independent. And the first form of independence is to be able to support oneself, and if possible, the children. So my, my life has been about that, and I have worked with women and for women all my life. I know them well. So when people say, oh, where do you get these characters, these female characters so strong, so resilient? Well, I don't know any weak woman do you? <laughs> I don't. And then I have a foundation 
that I don't run. My daughter-in-law runs it, Lori. And through the foundation, I get to hear the stories of women who have gone through hell. They have lost everything, some of them including their children. And, and yet, they get back on their feet, they survive, and some of them become leaders in their communities. So I, they are there. It's just a matter of being inspired by those wonderful, extraordinary people. Well, I'm glad you brought up your foundation. I was, I was going to ask you, uh, the, the foundation seeks to advance the, the freedoms and rights of women, in, including reproductive rights. And um, the news last week uh, with the, the leak of the Supreme Court document and, and the potential for Roe versus Wade to be overturned here in the country, um, I, I was curious, what was your reaction to that news? I was horrified first because we have been supporting, uh, the foundation has been supporting Planned Parenthood and many other organizations that work for, for reproductive rights. And because I, I grew up in a country where there was no, no possibility of abortion. We have abortion now in Chile uh, very recently only, but there are places one of them is, for example, El Salvador or, or Honduras or other places where if you have a miscarriage, you can go to prison, Guatemala also, you can go to prison for 30 years because it's supposedly you have committed a murder. So everybody is very worried about the embryo. And what about the woman? What about the woman and her life? So you can have, if you have religion, religious um, beliefs, don't get an abortion, but it has to be available for those people who need it and who don't have those restrictions. So why impose on everybody what a minority wants? Your foundation also um, advocates for women's freedom from violence. In, in The Soul of a Woman, you write, we have to consider violence against women for what it is, the greatest crisis that faces humanity. Can you talk about this? Yeah, ongoing? there's a war, an ongoing war against women. It, it, it sounds exaggerated when I say this, but think about it. Think about the many, many forms in which the patriarchy puts women down. It exerts violence, restriction against women. Repression of all kinds. We live in a very free society here, but my foundation works also in places where women are not free. Think about what happened and how, uh, how easily women lose the rights that they take for granted. It can happen very fast. Look what happened in Afghanistan. Women who had been professionals working out there for 20 years, comes the Taliban and in 24 hours they are under a burqa inside their homes. Uh, so it can be lost so easily that we have to be aware, and when they say, well, feminism is passé, it's not. And thank God now we have the Me Too movement who have, has given new energy to the feminist movement. And the young women are becoming very aware of how easily they can lose everything. Now, if Roe versus Wade is, is uh, re reversed, you say? Overturned. Overturned. Now you will be in the streets. Now you will be in the streets screaming like the feminists that we were when I was young. Because you will realize then what has been taken away from you. It's a right, an option that you should have. I was gonna ask, as a feminist today, what gives you hope? What, what advice do you have? for us? What I have seen in my life, we have come a long way, <laughs> and we still have a long way to go. But I, I was born in the middle of the Second World War in the 40s in Chile, in an authoritarian, patriarchal, Catholic family and society. And I have seen in my lifetime all what we have achieved as women. And I thought when I was young that it was such a fair, such a reasonable struggle that in a matter of a decade, we would have ended the patriarchy. I was very optimistic. <laughs> and, and now I see that it will take many more years, but it will happen because the curve 
is going someplace. We, are, we go back sometimes. There is backlash, but it will not be stopped. This resonates. <laughs> this resonates with something you, you've said once that, that really stood out to me, that you're, you aim to not just make the world better, but to make it good. Yeah, and better. Better from what? It has to be good, really good, and that's possible. But we have to start by dreaming it, by imagining it. Have a vision of what world we want. We want a world that is inclusive, that is beautiful, that is compassionate, that, that is very different from, that respects nature and treats other species with respect and with love. That's the world we want. We want a world in which greed and, and then a interest will not be what moves everything. It will be other things, just community, the joy of, of sharing. I think it's possible. Can sharing stories help us get there? I think that stories connect us. And um, you know, I, 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 my books are all over and I, we get a lot of mail and I, when I read the, the, what my readers write to me, I see that they, there's things in common, threads in common. And often people say, you changed my life because I saw in that book or in this book this and that. And I realized that I haven't done anything. I have only s put in words, in written words, what they already feel. People who connect to my books is because they think and feel like me. And so we are connected in a way that, that is very subliminal, but, but it's there. I, I haven't taught anything to anybody. I have just punched the button and made it happen because it's there inside their hearts. Your, your latest novel, Violetta, um, I think connects to us in some ways. Uh, the main character, Violetta, writes in that novel, the world is paralyzed and humanity is in quarantine. It is a strange symmetry that I was born in one pandemic and will die during another. Can you talk a little bit about your new novel, um, Violetta? I had so much fun writing it. I hope you have fun reading it if you do. Um, when my mother died before the pandemic, everybody said you have to write about your mother because I had such a deep connection with her. We wrote to each other every single day for decades. So I have thousands and thousands of letters. And so it was just natural that I would write about her, but I couldn't. I was just too close. But there was something else also. My mother was an extraordinary woman who lived in, lived in extraordinary times. But my mother was never independent. And this is what touches with what I said before. My mother pr first depended on her father, then her first husband, then the second husband, and eventually at the end of her life, me. Uh, so she, she never could support herself, and therefore she was always like frustrated. She could never do or, or, or explore all her talents, her vision, everything she wanted to do, because somebody else was paying the bills and giving the orders. So. She, she wasn't the right character for a novel, but I could create a character that would have economic independence and therefore the freedom that my mother didn't have. So I could give to this character everything I wanted for my mom, and that was fun, absolutely. And um, Violeta is born like my mother in 1920, which is when the first pandemic, the influenza pandemic, reached Chile and died and, and she dies, Violeta, in 2020, when the, we have the virus, the, the COVID. And in those 100 years that, that is her life, I had the pleasure of telling a lot about the 20th century, which I witnessed also. This pandemic has been difficult for a lot of people, and I'm just curious to know, what has your experience of it been? Well, it's been a very schizophrenic thing, because uh, on one hand, I am very aware of how much people, especially women, have suffered. 
through the foundation, we see an, a terrible increase in domestic violence to begin with. First, the first to lose their jobs were women. They will be the last to get them back. Trapped at home, schooling the kids with less income, less resources, and often with a companion that is drinking too much and that is as frustrated as they are. So the, the situation for most of the women I know through the foundation has been awful. But for me personally, it's been great because I have been in the attic writing and I have never been more productive in my life. I wrote The Soul of a Woman, Violetta, another book that is and another short story. And huh, I, if you give me a little bit more time, I can come up with another book in a few, in a few weeks. I mean, it's wonderful. Plus, I was recently married. So um, on one hand, I was trapped at home with this new husband that I knew very little. And let me tell you, at our age, there is a lot of baggage, <laughs> a lot. Uh, but also, I had kindness. I had someone that was, I wasn't alone. I think that if I had faced the pandemic alone with the dogs, it would have been pretty hard. So even, even if sometimes living together is hard because you have to share everything, it's much better than loneliness, for me at least. I've been with a man all my life. I think I fell in love the first time when I was around seven. And, and I have had so many, many in my life, but not all at the same time. <laughs> so they have been one at a time, and it works fine for me. I have had three marriages, and the first two lasted, one lasted 29 years, and the other one 28 years. The first one should have ended on year number 20, and the second one also 20. The other years were just trying to fix what was unfixable. And so now that I am married for the third time, I think that if I live long enough, it will be 20 more years, I, will can, I can have a fourth husband. <laughs> yeah. you, you mentioned in Soul of a Woman that um, in this pandemic, the, the sales of guns in the United States has soared. Well, in Chile, it's the sales of chocolate and wine and condoms that has <laughs> soared. So my, my question is, what are they doing right and what are we doing wrong? Well, in Italy, it was the same. <laughs> <laughs> it was wine and condoms. Yeah. Well, we are doing a lot of things wrong. <laughs> the, the, the first thing that is sort of silly is that the country would be polarized and divided because of the pandemic. I mean, you can be divided for politics and that's, but, but something that is a public health issue should unite people, not divide them. We should all be in the same boat trying to deal with the virus. So you've been at home writing um, in close quarters with your new husband. You've said recently- He's not here, that's why I can't, <laughs> I can't talk like that. You've talked a, a lot um, in, in recent writings and, and, and speeches about finding love uh, and romance later in life. Well, let's say love. <laughs> <laughs> and um, you've said that your old age is a precious gift. That's a direct quote. And um, so I'm curious to know, what's love like after 37, say? <laughs> At 80, you mean? <laughs> what's love like? You know, it, I'm taking a philosophy class, and the, one, the last class, we, de we dealt with the theme of love, how love has been treated along the ages by different philosophers. That's the class. And the, the Greeks uh, said that they are, the love has three stages. The first stage is called eros, when you find the person and you think nobody's more beautiful and, and smarter and wonderful, that's Eros, when you fall madly in love. And usually it doesn't last very much because it's an altered state of mind. I mean, you are crazy. <laughs> and then there comes Philia, which is the, 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 the friendship, the, the sympathy, the time you share, that that can last a very long time. And then there is a third stage, 
which is, uh, it happens very seldom, which is called agape. And that is when um, you love so much that you want, it, you are, want the happiness of that person more than your own. And I think that that happens to all mothers with their kids, but very seldom with their husband. <laughs> For example, let's say that Roger comes to me tomorrow and says, you know what, I fell in love with the blonde next door. Uh, I'm sorry, but that's the way it goes. And if I am in the agape stage, I would say, oh, I want you to be happy. <laughs> uh, uh, please, feel free. Uh, can I help in any way? Uh, maybe I can talk to her and, and, and tell her, how do you like your eggs for breakfast? <laughs> Now, I know that I will never reach that stage. I would cut his balls. <laughs> so, when you ask me how is, uh, <laughs> how is love at this age, I didn't go through the Eros stage because I was just too old. I mean, I was 70 something and, and he was the same age. It was not as, as, as if I was in front of Antonio Banderas, no. <laughs> So that, let's skip that part. And then we come into the second part, which is the wonderful friendship all you share. And, and there's romance in that too. And we really spend wonderful time together. And I think that's good enough. Very good, actually. <laughs> now, would I change, would I change all this that we have achieved? for one night with Antonio Banderas? <laughs> ah, I would have to think about it. <laughs> Is your husband Roger retired? No, but he, when he retires, he will be really screwed <laughs> because I don't have time for him. <laughs> really, I don't. So he will have to take some sport. I don't know what he will do. Maybe that will be the agape stage. And I will say, you want the blonde? Go ahead. <laughs> Go ahead. Well, you've written about retirement and, and the, the differences in English and Spanish. In English, it's retirement, to retire, to, to go away somewhere. But in Spanish, it's jubilarse, which comes from the word jubilo, which means jubilation. It's the time when supposedly is the best time in your life, unfortunately. It, when it happens, you have less resources, your health is failing, the, it's not the most joyful unless you have prepared for that. Do you plan to retire? No. Well, I mean, if I retire, my, my son would go crazy because I, I have too much energy. So I would start moving the furniture and doing things that he would have to do. I would just have to give the orders. <laughs> well, we have quite a few questions from the audience here. I thought we could turn oh, to great. those next. Um, and, and just as by way of announcement, um, usually Isabel is very happy to sign uh, books uh, after events like these, but due to COVID, we're gonna have to skip the book signing tonight. Um, but if you would like, you can find Isabel bo Isabel's books up in the lobby. Book and passage. they're already signed. Um, book and, and also we have, um, how do you call them, Nico, book? book plates, so you can stick them there also. Okay. And Book Passage has a table up in the lobby that you can check out, and we're yeah. very grateful to Book Passage for supporting College of Marine Library. Thank you. And for inviting Isabel to come here tonight. So let's take a look here. Um, here's one for you. How scandalized were the readers by your body subject matter when Eva Luna first came out? Body matter, which body matter? <laughs> body, um, I think in terms of this, the sexual content. I, I hope they were delighted <laughs> and aroused <laughs> and, not, and not shocked. I mean, unless they were evangelicals, then why would they be shocked? <laughs> and, and really, Eva Luna is a very sensual book. I wrote it in Venezuela, and it's a very Venezuelan book. It's about, it, it's about a place that, that I loved, it, uh, green, abundant, generous, happy in many ways, 
it, it, has, it has been in a terrible political crisis for a long time now. But the country is wonderful and the people are so, the, the, I mean, any excuse is good for a party, for dancing and, and drinking and singing. That's wonderful. Did you ever make it back? And um, plus, they have the most beautiful women in the world. They, w they win all the beauty pageants. And they, um, if you go to the beach in Venezuela, you see something. <laughs> and the men, let me tell you, with these speedos, incredible. <laughs> Do you ever make it back to those Venezuelan beaches? Well, it's wonderful. Not right now. And I, it's too late for me now. <laughs> Maybe Antonio Banderas will be there. <laughs> Here's another question from the audience. Who has influenced you most in your life and how? The women I have met. The extraordinary women I have met. Starting with my mother, of course, but many others that, that have, I mean, they have helped me all along the way, starting with my mother-in-law who helped me raise my kids, the women who worked in my house and raised the kids while I was working in something else, um, all the women in the foundation, my daughter-in-law, my daughter, my agent, they are all women. The, the, the men that have helped me along the way have been my grandfather, my stepfather, and my son, and that's it. The rest are all women. We have another question from the audience. What is your relationship with Chile today? How has it changed over the years? I am in touch permanently. I mean, on a on chat with friends daily. And I follow the news. And I'm fascinated with what's happening right now in Chile. That we have a, a very interesting situa political situation. Uh, but I, I, I don't think I could live there because the people I love the most are here. My work is here, the foundation, everything is here. So I will probably die here, but I will always have a foot in Chile. And right now, I, I, it's fascinating because Chile has elected um, a, a new government that is a leftist, the coalition of, of the left. And the president is 36 years old, uh, Gabriel Boric. And the agenda is a, the, 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 the plan for the government, and that's how he was elected, is that um, there's gender parity for everything. So women are in the same position as men in every aspect of the government. And to prove it, the cabinet is 14 women and 10 men. Um, the, there is um, great, uh, great focus on environment and climate change, nature, inclusion, everybody's included in the country, even in immigrants as well. Um, it's um, uh, the idea also that the natural resources have to belong to the people or benefit the people at least. They cannot be all in private hands. Uh, the constitution that we have had since the dictatorship privatized everything. So everything, even the water that you drink, belongs to somebody. And the, there is a huge middle class that lives on credit. There is hidden poverty. And 20% of the population that do not, uh, are not sheltered by the state. So they, they handle little, little businesses. They, they sort of manage their lives without even thinking that the government is there to help. And, uh, and so that needs to change. And uh, I think that they have great opposition. The conservatives are very powerful and they own the country. They have the also, uh, not they don't have any majority in the Congress, so to pass any law is difficult. Plus, they, are, they have no experience, political experience. They have just good intentions. So I don't know if they will be able to do what they want, but it's a beautiful plan, it's a project. You mentioned you always have one foot in Chile. Does, does it feel like home for you here in yeah, Marin? Yeah, yeah, it does, absolutely. I've lived in, in Marin since I came here in 1987, imagine. Uh, so I, this is my, my home is here. As I said before, the people I love, my dogs, so, of course, this is my home. 
this question circles back to A Long Petal of the Sea. How many of the characters in the book are based on real people? Most of them. Uh, most of them. Pablo Neruda, of course, who got the Winnipeg and brought the people. But the character of uh, Victor in the book is based on Victor Pei, a friend of mine who was one of the passengers in the Winnipeg, and he told me the story. Elizabeth Eidenberg, was she also a historical Yeah, she's figure? a historical figure, yes. Her story was amazing in, in A Long Petal of the Sea. It's a well. beautiful story. This is a woman who spent her life uh, working for children in, in zones of war, in places of war. So she would go from one war to another helping the children. And uh, she was Austrian, I think. I don't remember very well. I think she was Austrian. And she ended up quietly in her little village, a very quiet old age, until people remembered. The people she had saved became adults, and they remembered. And they looked for her to thank her. And it's a beautiful, beautiful story. You have a, a rigid writing process. Could you describe that for us? Yeah. Uh, I start all my books on January 8th. Because you have to have a date to start, or I would be procrastinating forever. Uh, that means that by January 7th, I am prepared. I know that the next day, it, I have to start something. So um, I, I always work in the morning. I'm not good at night. And so I get up around, I wake up around half past five, but I don't get up until half past six. And that gives me time to have my coffee, walk the dogs, put on full makeup and high heels, <laughs> and go up to the attic. And then I work several hours a day. But you know, the, the good thing about working at home is that I can go up every time that I have an idea, or if I wake up in the middle of the night. So it's very convenient for me. I work a lot, but I like it. Do you have any advice for my students so they finish their papers on time? <laughs> Yeah, smoke pot. <laughs> I don't know, something like that. Well, it's legal in California, isn't it? We'll talk next week about the <laughs> advice you've heard today. Well, I, I have a few hundred more questions here, but I think- Well, what's we have, the time? We have time for, I think, one more question. Um, and uh, Isabel, you've had so many, many accomplishments in your career, and you've had such a positive impact on so many people, millions of people, uh, through your writing and your humanitarian work. And so I'm, I'm curious, what's next? What can we expect next? You know, I live one day at a time, not because I'm old, but I've always lived one day at a time. I never make plans because my life has been up and down. There's been a lot of losses and tragedies and, and things that were completely unexpected and crossroads in which I, I think I'm going in one direction and something happens and I have to turn in another way. So I don't make plans. I, I, I try to live one day at a time, live today as fully as I can. And the, the only project I have is the book I'm writing now. I don't think I've, about what I'm going to do on January 8th, next year, because maybe I will be dead. So what's the point of wasting my time? <laughs> yeah, that can happen. Well, Isabel, uh, on behalf of College of Marin, thank you for sharing thank your you, time. Thank you, David. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Isabel Allende.